uh, all the panelists are ready sure okay i'm going to start uh, also hello ullas i just take yes, care sir. of meeting the participants yes i will do that okay so good evening everyone Okay. Uh, welcome to this special asset panel discussion on the origins and solution of SARS CoV-2. Asset is an acronym for Advances in Science, Engineering, and Technology. Author of asset called Instrumentation and Electronics Colloquium was established in TIFR in 1980. Asset colloquia complement two more, two other colloquia at the TIFR in Mumbai, namely the NSF and MAP colloquia. It deals with topics on detectors, instrumentation, electronics, software, medicine, popular science, and so on. Organized PM on all working Fridays. Uh, it's traditionally the concluding academic event of the week at TIFR. Today's asset event. is in a special format namely a panel discussion by some of the most distinguished experts in the field of today's topic first thing first thanks to professor vivek datta for suggesting this topic and also a few possible speakers but later on it was left to professor suma ramakrishnan and ullas kolthur who actually did all that is necessary to bring the suggestion to a reality uma will of course moderate and ullas will summarize today's panel discussion on behalf of tifr asset and covid gyan i would like to sincerely thank today's panelists uh, professor sahid jamil director tivedi school of biosciences asoka university professor deepa agashe ncbs tifr bengaluru professor rahul siddhartan imsc chennai dr robin mukopadhyay Tata Memorial Center Mumbai and Professor Vardarajan Sundar Murthy and CBS DIFR Bangalore. Admittedly, uh, due to the special format of the event, it may not quite fit into the usual time slot of the asset colloquium, but I'm sure it will be very informative and highly engaging. I'm sure there will be enough time, therefore, available at the end of the at the end for discussion and taking questions from the participants. So please type in your questions in chat windows of Zoom and. youtube platforms but uh, those participants who are on zoom can also of course directly ask the questions but during the question answer period so with that let me first invite professor ullas kolthur to formally introduce the plan and the panelists and from where professor omar ramkrishna will take over and conduct the rest of the proceedings thank you very much over to ullas yeah, thanks sir again uh, welcome everyone um Uh, we have put together as uh, uh, Satya um, just briefly about um, a panel of distinguished uh, scientists um, drawn from various fields, but uh, relevant for the discussion that we're going to have uh, today. Um, for most, uh, Professor Shahid Jamil, which uh, I mean, who probably doesn't need an introduction because most of us would have uh, heard or read about him in uh, in various platforms. Uh, Shahid is the director of Trivedi of uh, Trivedi School of Biosciences at uh, Ashoka University. He's a virologist by training, and uh, until recently he was heading the Insacoc. Um, he's been one of the um, uh, experts in the field of virology, and um, yeah, you, like I said, you must have read about uh, his opinions and his uh, um, insights into uh, in general uh, viruses, but also about uh, SARS-CoV-2. So welcome, Shahid. Shahid will be the chair of the panel. and he also uh, open the discussion um for today's topic um it's my pleasure to uh, also introduce uh, robin mukhyapadhyay who was until recently uh, uh, a very active scientist at uh, actrec or cancer research uh, institute in mumbai uh, he is also a virologist and right now he is uh, an expert um, at uh, uh, pirac and he gives again expert advice to uh, dbt uh he expertises in um, molecular virology and biotechnology and has also looked at extensively about uh, the genomes uh, and modifications of the virus uh, viruses themselves uh so thanks again robin for joining us um 
Deepa, Dr. Deepa Agashe, who is an evolutionary biologist at the NCBS Bangalore, which is also a center of TIFR. Um, she works on molecular uh, evolution um, and especially of the genomes and looking at how mutations uh, impact survival and fitness. Uh, again, something that's relevant for today's topic. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Varada, um, who is an inf infectious uh, uh, in a disease biologist. Um, he specializes in host pathogen interaction, something that is also relevant for how um, the virus is infecting all of us and also viruses probably evolving based on the host responses. Um, we have uh, Dr. Rahul Siddharthan from IAC, uh, IMSC uh, Chennai, um, who is a computational biologist, uh, who looks at regulatory uh, genomics, uh, also is, has interest in evolutionary biology, again, something that will be relevant for today's discussion on, on the origins and uh, evolution of uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, these are the lead panelists. Uh, Uma, who is also going to be a panelist, but also uh, but will be uh, mostly moderating the discussion today, uh, is from, again, NCBS TIFA. Um, she is an evolutionary ecologist. Um, she studies population genetics and mostly interested in the conflict between humans and the nature. Um, something which we all forget and probably is going to be important for understanding how viruses jump hosts and uh, again, you know, the emergence of newer forms of diseases um, during our lifetimes. So with this, I, I will uh, uh, welcome again all the panelists. Um, the discussion is going to be largely structured into three parts. Uh, one will be, um, uh, the first part will be largely Opening statements are um, inputs that are going to be provided by the experts. Uh, again, um, Shahid will give an outline to this and he will begin the discussion. Following that, we'll have an open uh, question and answer session um, where, wherein all of you, including the panelists and all the audience can ask questions to the panelists. Um, and we'll conclude the session uh, or uh, the discussion with, uh, cl with closing remarks uh, wherein we would like to specifically highlight the importance of um, this kind of research in India and the benefits of understanding how uh, what viruses do. Uh, so with that, I will leave it to Uma to uh, take over and Shahid to please begin the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Ullas, and thanks everyone for coming. It's uh, really uh, nice to see so many people attending a Zoom session despite a year plus of Zoom, which has fatigued all of us, I'm sure. Um, um, so I won't uh, speak much more. I'll let Shahid take it away and uh, I'll come back later with questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lars, and thank you, Uma. Uh, what I will do is uh, maybe just uh, set the stage uh, with a very brief uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, just simply highlighting what the facts are, what the issues are and then uh, we can take it from there. Okay. So where did it come from? Uh, if you look at I, what yeah. happened, are you, able, the, are you able to see the slide? Yes, perfect, perfect. Thanks. Oh, you so can wonderful. see, but if you can put it in full screen. It is full screen. It's full, full screen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's full it's screen. Full. They can see it. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. Can I suggest everybody who's not speaking mute? Thanks. So um, if you go back uh, to when the disease uh, came up, uh, the early reports from Wuhan, uh, it was really first picked up by ProMed, which is uh, you know, a global system of, uh, of messages essentially. And it was picked up on the 30th of December, 2019. And there is the original, uh, uh, original sort of, uh, message from the ProMed side. Uh, but then later, uh, 
some Chinese newspapers uh, published some uh, some references to uh, doctors in Wuhan who had uh, sort of said that there were people who had also become ill in September, for example, with a CT diagnosis, which uh, so which which resembled uh, what we know of uh, COVID now. But, uh, you know, the Chinese CDC put a gag order on 25th of February on something like this. And uh, these references were then removed fairly quickly. So keep those dates in mind. Now, here is the summary of the joint WHO China study report, the WHO uh, committee, which went to China and spent uh, a couple of weeks there between 14th of January to 10th of February. So here are their uh, four possible pathways. They, they thought that the direct uh, zoonotic spillover uh, would be a possible to likely pathway. The introduction of the virus into human population through an intermediate host uh, they considered as likely to very likely. Introduction of the virus to humans through the food chain or through uh, frozen food was also considered as a possible pathway. And they said that a laboratory incident was going to be extremely unlikely. And you know that some recent uh, write-ups have, uh, have appeared, which provide some circumstantial evidence that uh, you know the lab leak hypothesis uh, may also be possible and not extremely unlikely as pointed out by the WHO team. And that is essentially what we are discussing today. So you have seen this many times over. I have put this here just to emphasize that by now we have over 2 million submissions in GSA. And based on that, phylogenetic trees have been, uh, uh, have been constructed. And I've also noted here the four variants of concern uh, that we know now, alpha, gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. But what I really want you to look at is the extreme lower left corner. This is the virus that came out of Wuhan. Uh, and the, the virus that really came out of Wuhan is hardly to be found in circulating in the human population now. It diversified very quickly. And in early January 2020, in January 2020, another mutation was noted, which we call the D614G mutation. And really, uh, that is the ancestor for all, almost all the viruses that are circulating in the human population today. So the question is that what comes before this? What comes before December 2019? Do we have a common progenitor virus uh, before this? Is it, a, is it a virus that came from bat? Is it something that came from another animal species? What is it? <clears throat> so there are some recent papers. Here is a paper. Uh, by Sudhir Kumar's group uh, in Philadelphia. And I'll not go into the details, but uh, just read what uh, the end result is, that the progenitor was spreading worldwide months before and after the first reported cases of COVID-19 in China. And they sort of using, uh, you know, tracking evolutionary history and tracking methods, they looked at, uh, progenitor genomes, uh, and they found, they identified two, uh, sorry, they identified one, and uh, a very recent paper that has come up in BioArchive on 22nd of June is based on some uh, deep sequencing data that was deleted from the NIH server on the request of the Chinese investigator who submitted it there so from this data, Jesse Bloom has been able to reconstruct partial sequences of 13 early epidemic viruses. Uh, and the conclusion here is that uh, 
this suggests that the food market, which has been implicated, uh, uh, you know, the viruses from there are not fully representative of, of viruses, of the early viruses. And, and this paper also concludes that the progenitor, uh, there are possibly two progenitors uh, which they identified. One was the same as the one identified by Sudhir Kumar's group and reported earlier. So uh, the point of this paper is really to show that you can also go to cloud servers and, uh, and, and get sequences uh, that may have been deleted uh, to construct evolutionary history of uh, viruses. Okay. So uh, have viruses leaked from labs in the past? They certainly have. Uh, let me take you back to smallpox. And there were three leaks of smallpox, uh, all from UK. 1972 at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, a lab worker. 1966 and 78, uh, Birmingham Medical School, and it happened identically. It's just that the 66 leak was only, uh, only discovered after people found out what had happened in 78. And what had happened in 78 was that a photographer got infected and that, that photographer worked in a studio which was just below the lab where the smallpox uh, virus uh, work was being done. Uh, although Britain in, in the period of uh, 1960s and 70s had only four natural cases, these three leaks together uh, led to 80 cases and three deaths uh, from smallpox. Another curious case is the 1977 H1N1 flu. Uh, you know that the 1918 flu was caused by H1N1 virus and it was replaced by H2N2 virus which caused the Asian flu pandemic and then a few years later by the H3N2 virus which caused the Hong Kong uh, pandemic in 68. But uh, the 1970, in 1977, there was an outbreak uh, in, uh, in several countries and the virus was traced to East Soviet Union and Northeast China, both places it was isolated. And this was identical to the 1918 virus. Uh, and uh, so, so here the conclusion which was reached was that the 1918 virus uh, saved uh, from the 1950s in one of these locations uh, led to the leak, although neither China nor Soviet Union has agreed to that. In 1995, uh, uh, Venezuelan uh, equine encephalitis, uh, which is an insect-borne uh, transmitted virus, uh, caused about 100,000 cases in, in several countries in South America. The virus turned out to be identical to the 1963 virus, and there was no sign of its circulation for 28 years, and suddenly popped up, and the sequence was exactly like that of the 63 virus. So again, uh, possibly a black leak. And of course, we know about the 2002-2003 SARS. Uh, there were several examples. There was a lab worker in Singapore, another lab worker in Taiwan, and another in China uh, got infected while working in the labs and transmitted to several family members and medical personnel. Uh, 2007, there was a case of foot and mouth disease virus, which is an animal virus. Uh, it affects cattle. And this leaked into untreated water from a vaccine manufacturing facility at the Institute for Animal Health in Perthright, UK, uh, and caused uh, uh, some disease at, at farms. So there have been instances of lab leaks uh, in the most recent past. Now let us look at the arguments for uh, whether the SARS coronavirus 2 leaked. So here are the arguments that uh, people have made. Uh, the first argument is that the virus emerged in Wuhan, which is also home to the 
Wuhan Institute of Virology, where scientists work on bat coronaviruses. And the Wuhan Institute for Virology is not very far from the wet market where the first cases uh, emerged. But uh, as I showed you in the two papers uh, that have come out recently, uh, the food market was probably a victim uh, of uh, the virus rather than a source of the leak. The second argument is that there is no intermediate animal host ever been found. The third is that the virus is perfectly adapted for causing a pandemic and therefore it must have been made in a lab. The fourth point is that the virus has features suggesting that it was made in a lab. So for example, a furin cleavage site uh, is uh, brought in. Uh, the next point is that the virus closely resembles bat viruses collected from a mine in eastern China in the period of 2012 to 2015. And finally, something that came up more recently is that three staff members at the Wuhan Institute for Virology were sick with COVID-like illness in November 2019, before we saw pneumonia popping up in Wuhan in December 2019. Okay, so let us look at these arguments. Uh, Wuhan, the Virology Institute and Emergence. Well, the point is that specialized virology labs are usually located in areas that are frequented by those viruses. So having a coronavirus lab in China is uh, no surprise. There are influenza labs all over Asia. There's hemorrhagic fever lab in Africa. There's dengue fever labs in uh, Latin America because that's where those viruses are usually found. The argument that there is no intermediate host found uh, we, it will be good to remind ourselves that it took about 14 years to discover that the Himalayan civet cat was the intermediate host for the first uh, SARS coronavirus. And that is possibly, it, it, it is difficult to detect viruses from uh, animals because they often show no disease and the virus levels are also low. So far in China, about 8,000 animal species have been sampled. Uh, but that's really minuscule compared to the animal population in that country. The third argument is the virus is perfectly adapted to humans. Well, this is wrong. Uh, we have seen how much change the virus has undergone. It has undergone a lot of adaptation. The first mutation that appeared very, very quickly was the D614G mutation. We also see the P681R or H mutation in the spike protein. Uh, both of these lead to uh, better infection uh, in, in, in human cells. And by now there are about 750 changes in the spike uh, protein uh, in all the viruses that are uh, sequenced so far. Uh, whether viruses were collected from a mine, uh, the reports have been published from China from this lab at Wuhan that about 300 coronaviruses were recovered from bats, but only about a dozen gave partial or full sequence information. And according to them, none matched uh, this current virus. Uh, about the sick uh, staffers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, there really is no information available uh, at this time. Uh, coming to the engineering of the furin cleavage site, and this is, uh, a diagram from Balram's article in Current Science in, in uh, you know, earlier this month. And what he did was to compare uh, the two bat viruses and uh, several uh, coronaviruses, uh, human coronaviruses, and showed that, uh, uh, that this furin cleavage site, this extra uh, R residue uh, is missing uh, sorry, uh, this whole peptide here uh, uh, is missing from the bat viruses, but it is something that has possibly been introduced uh, in the spike protein. Well, uh, the fact is that there are many common cold coronaviruses that have furin cleavage sites, and uh, viruses containing the site are scattered across the uh, corona family tree in alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses. 
and they are not really confined to a group of closely related viruses. So it is possible that these furin cleavage sites have also evolved multiple times, uh, and this might be a case of convergent evolution. The second argument made is that the uh, this arginine, uh, these arginines in this in the site, have used a codon uh, CGG, which is a very rare codon in in humans, uh, but the argument against that is that viruses do not always follow uh, the human optimized uh, codon strategy. So uh, this could have been very natural. All right, so let me end here by just asking, and this maybe is something that we can discuss. What is the way forward? Uh, will this ever get resolved? Personally, I don't think it will ever get resolved. Uh, simply because uh, China will never open up lab notebooks, computers, lab freezers, hospital records. It's unlikely that that will happen. Uh, who should really be investigating this? Uh, should WHO continue to investigate it? Even the first mission of WHO came under a lot of credibility uh, crisis. Uh, so possibly uh, WHO may not be the right uh, organization to, to look at it, uh, because at this point, uh, whoever looks at it has to be not just credible, but also appear to be credible. Uh, so I wonder whether the global science community, community can play a role, whether, for example, uh, science academies uh, across the world come together and the community of scientists can uh, can address this, but, so, but of course, the Chinese Academy of Sciences would have to be a part of it and how much uh, uh, cooperation will be there remains to be seen. Uh, and finally, what might be the implications for science? Uh, would this lead to more tightening of the science of, for this kind of research, which uh, is needed at this time to really understand these viruses and uh, understand their behavior. So those are some of the points I'll leave you with uh, and we can uh, discuss this further. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Shahid. That was a really good uh, summary and start. Um, I'll now ask uh, Rahul to go ahead and uh, share his thoughts and points. Uh, thanks, Omar. Um, I guess uh, you can hope you can see my screen. Uh, thanks, Shahid, for uh, an excellent introduction, which makes my job a little easier. I thought I'll start with this cartoon from the far side, which was a Can't comic see it strip yet. that ran. Uh, okay, let me try. Um, Can't something see it. is uh, okay. Um, I'm not able to. It's, Rahul, you have is to, it work, is you it have working now? The, you have to keep it open. If you have it, you uh, minimize it more. Whole, whole screen rather than yes, only yes, window. I have done that, but somehow that's not working. And uh, stop sharing window? is also not working. Uh, oh. the internet, uh, just disappeared. I mean, for a fraction of a second, we did. We were able to see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it now? No, no we can't. Okay, you something is, or is happening. Worked. Yeah, uh, we tested earlier and it worked. Yeah. Um, of course, one usual technique is to log out and log in, but then we'll lose you. Then we'll, a... you'll lose me for a moment, but maybe I should do that. Let me just... Um, can uh, or not try disabling ah. my share and re-enabling it? Yeah. Uh, okay, I can do that. Uh, so I'll kind of make you Yeah, do you want to try now? Okay, yeah. Can you see something now? Yes, yes. Okay, now Yes, yes, we can see a cartoon. Fantastic, great. Uh, yes, so, okay, good. So that's the sort of clickbait. This is nothing to do with 
COVID-19. This is from a cartoon strip called The Far Side that used to run from 79 to 95 or so. So the cartoon is Gary Larson might have been prescient or I don't know whether there was some other viral outbreak out there. So I thought I'll start with that on a light note. Um, let me continue with the slides. Um, so um, Shahid, I think covered almost all the ground that I'm going to be talking about, which is where did SARS come from and how do we answer that? So maybe I'll go into a little bit more of the um, um, slightly technical stuff of how people analyze this kind of thing, but I'll be very brief about it. Essentially, what you have is a lot of um, genomic sequences. And um, so in this case, these are, I'm sorry, these are um, RNA viruses, meaning the genetic material for them is a single-stranded ribonucleic acid, unlike in our bodies and in most living organisms where it's DNA, uh, certain viruses use RNA. And so it's a sequence of letters that you can read as A, U, G, and C. And you can think of them as just uh, long sentences. And as viruses reproduce, they mutate, meaning some of these letters change. And what biologists do is sequence these viruses to see how similar they are. And then you can represent them on a tree. Um, to a biologist or a computer scientist. So to, you know, normally trees have a root at the bottom, but usually in biology, trees have a root at the top or on the side, in this case on the side. So this is called the root and these are called leaves. Um, so um, this is uh, not COVID, this is some other virus, I uh, forget what, from a paper in 2011. Uh, but the basic idea is that um, viruses that are plotted nearby are most similar. So this horizontal distance indicates how far apart they are. These two are the closest, these are the next closest. And as you plot the tree, you can classify the viruses into groups. And uh, that's essentially what people have done for coronaviruses also. Um, at this point, there are, um, I think, dozens of clades. And as Shahid said, um, I think tens of thousands of sequenced strains just for um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, okay, so this is a slide that we've already been through. So uh, before getting to this, how do sequences evolve? I mentioned one way that you know letters can change and they are called mutations, but it turns out letters can also be um, uh, replaced whole scale via what's called horizontal transfer. So if you have two viruses nearby, um, they can actually exchange material, uh, it does happen. And this is most likely to happen when parts of the genome are similar and a very similar thing happens in meiosis in humans and in all organisms. So you have two similar um, molecules of DNA or RNA, they can cross over and exchange pieces. And that is important to um, this point. So I'd like to mildly correct uh, uh, what uh, Shahid said here, the controversy about, so um, as uh, Shahid said, this figure is from Balram's paper. It's um, um, the second line is the um, bat uh, coronavirus, which is believed to be the closest known to SARS-CoV-2. And this guy is SARS-CoV-1. And if you see here, this SARS-CoV-2 has this sequence, which is not present either in the closest bat relative or in SARS-CoV-1. Um, it is present in certain other coronaviruses, but not in exactly the same form. And this is called a furin cleavage site. Uh, basically, it occurs in the spike protein and um, it uh, is cleaved by a molecule called furin and that's believed to be essentially a causative agent for severe disease. And the fact that this is there in this is one um, indication that it might be um, significant. The perhaps bigger issue that people pointed out is, so if you look at this PRRA, R. This is uh, proline arginine, arginine. Um, um, so the R basically is arginine. Um, it's one of the amino acids. So for those who are uh, unfamiliar, um, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And these letters, um, I had said the letters A, U, C, G, T is the equivalent of G in DNA. Um, the three letters at a time code for one amino acid, but there are uh, lots of different possible combinations of three letters and only 20 amino acids. So there are certain 
um, I mean, assets that are coded for by multiple letters. And in the case of Arjun, there are actually six codons that code for it. But um, if you look at coronaviruses, this particular codon CGG is in fact the rarest of the lot. Only 5% of arginines in the SARS-CoV-2 genome are coded for by this particular codon. On the other hand, it is the most common codon in human. Uh, if you search for the arginine in human, uh, something like 20%, if I remember right, are coded for by CGG. So when people saw this, that there is an insertion here compared to the nearest relatives, and it has this double R, which is coded for by this particularly rare codon. The, a lot of people flag this as a concern that this does not look like something that happened naturally, but if a human were designing it in a lab, they might choose to use this codon because um, that's what humans think of. Um, is that really the case? Um, uh, I think the jury is kind of out on it. So this is a paper from uh, Wu and Zhao earlier, a uh, couple of months ago, I think. Um, comparing lots of different clades of coronaviruses. So these are alpha, gamma, uh, delta. So these are not to be confused with the variants we are talking about today. These are entire classes of coronaviruses. Um, and the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is a beta coronavirus. So it's not represented here. But what they have shown here is the particular furin site at uh, S1, S2 as it appears in SARS-CoV-2 and blue is the furin site at S2. And on the right hand side, um, they have shown uh, the furin site at, in beta coronaviruses at, in various clades, Marbecovirus and Mbecovirus. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 is not shown here. It is a Sarbecovirus. But um, what they are saying is this furin site appears extensively in certain clades, like in gamma coronaviruses, but it also randomly inserts in um, various other groups. And it does not appear in any other known Sarbicovirus, but it does appear in this Merbicovirus group, which is basically where the MERS virus came from, the Middle Eastern respiratory thing. And uh, it appears, as Shahid said, in many uh, human common cold viruses and things like that. So the, and what about the CGG, CGG codon giveaway? So that does not appear anywhere here, but something very similar, I think it is CGG, CGA or CGG, CGG, T, something like that appears in a feline coronavirus, even though CGG is a rare codon. So the argument is that this is not unprecedented. It could have occurred by recombination by a virus meeting another virus that happened to have that piece. So it is not, um, something that proves anything. Whether um, it is indicative of some um, dirty work at play, uh, it's really hard to say. So with that, I'll move on to this paper by Jesse Bloom that also Shahid talked about. Um, he's basically, um, the paper is about how Google does not forget. So essentially it's uh, the Chinese group had uploaded a whole bunch of sequences on NCBI's website and then requested deleting the sequences. These sequences cannot be deleted by the user, but the user can request NCBI to delete them and that's what has happened. Um, but NCBI itself does not store those sequences, they use Google Cloud and it turns out that um, they were still available on the Google Cloud if you cleverly guessed what URL they were and that's what he did. So um, in the beginning, uh, Bloom points out the ambiguity about what the, so the, essentially the goal here is to find the progenitor sequence, which is the sequence from which all sequences that you currently know are descended. So it's like the root of that tree. If you put all the known current sequences on a tree, the progenitor would be at the root um, or somewhere near the root. But uh, if you try to infer this progenitor, there's a problem that the earliest known sequences are from the Hunan seafood market, uh, but they are quite different from uh, these uh, bad coronaviruses than sequences corrected later outside Wuhan. Now, what he says is uh, assembling these um, missing sequences. He is not able to fully assemble them, but he could greatly assemble a lot of them. Uh, before getting to that, you know, here is the issue that Shahid also pointed out in terms of what China has been doing. Uh, so I'd like to make clear, most of what we know 
from the early stages of the disease came thanks to Chinese scientists. They were the ones who sequenced it uh, very quickly. They are the ones who raised the alarm, uh, published a lot of papers and so on. Um, so let's say there is a lot of anti-China sentiment around the world right now in India, thanks to things that happened at the border last year, and uh, the rest of the world, thanks to what's been happening in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and uh, Taiwan and everything. But this should not be extended to the Chinese people. Um, Chinese scientists, whether in China or outside, have been doing uh, heroic work on this uh, project. But um, what seems to have happened is that there's a crackdown by the Chinese government. So it appears that this was acknowledged early on that there are cases that uh, don't seem to be linked to the Hunan seafood market. But at some point, the Chinese government decided that this is not a good narrative and they issued this clampdown order that Chai also referred to. And finally, when the WHO uh, China report came out, they basically said all the reported prior cases are not COVID um, based on various um, justifications. Now, what Bloom says is that these deleted sequences that he has recovered are not basically um, that similar to the Wuhan market. They uh, carry these telltale mutations that suggest a different progenitor, um, one, uh, two possible different progenitors, one of which had previously been suggested. And uh, more than that, Bloom says there is no plausible scientific reason for the deletion. Why did they ask for this deletion? Nobody knows and they won't say. But the most interesting thing is that if he could recover these from Google Cloud, maybe other deleted sequences are still available somewhere within CBI itself or in some other cloud. And is it possible to do an investigation even without Chinese cooperation? So um, none of this proves that it is a lab leak, but when people try to hide something that raises suspicions. So I'll conclude by just summarizing, you know, what can we learn from this? It is impossible to say whether it's a natural spillover or a lab leak. Um, it's impossible to prove either hypothesis or conclusively disprove either. But a lot of people who signed a letter last year saying it is definitely a lab leak are now hedging and some of them are actually saying they are, are definitely not a lab leak and now thinking it could be a lab leak. The spillover remains highly probable, but where did it happen? Maybe not at that one on market. Maybe, um, maybe, uh, there's evidence that it was circulating quite a bit before December 2019, and finding the original source might be really hard. What does a lab leak mean? Um, there were early suggestions that it was a bioweapon being developed, which is kind of ridiculous. I don't think any serious scientist believes that. Um, could it be a genetically modified virus? So there has been a lot of uh, um, discussion on gain of function uh, research, meaning that modifying viruses to become more virulent uh, with the justification that this helps us develop vaccines um, or other treatments better by understanding the virulence of viruses better. So there has been controversy on this for years before uh, COVID-19. And back in 2014, a group of scientists wrote a, uh, argued for a moratorium on this kind of research. Um, but in any case, if this was a genetically modified virus, it is hard to say the furin cleavage site could be an indicator, but such sites also do occur naturally. So um, it's very hard to infer it based on sequence evidence. Could it be the leak of an unmodified virus? They could have been stockpiling a lot of viruses in that lab and one of them leaked in an accident. It is, in my opinion, a possibility. Uh, one point is that um, the Wuhan uh, Institute of Virology had a database of viruses uh, that they collected from these caves, backed coronaviruses, which they deleted in September 20. They took offline and they are not uh, sharing that data even confidentially with other researchers. Why did they do that? And uh, they have also been known to um, do research on published research on bat coronaviruses in what's called a BSL-2 facility, biosafety level two. Whereas it's recommended since 2014 that such research should only be done in BSL-4 facilities. So there are various uncomfortable things here. Um, it is possible in my opinion that um, they had collected a lot of viruses and were keeping them there and maybe one leaked out, but it is equally possible or maybe more possible that it is a spillover from um, a wildlife market or from uh, some other natural source. Sorry. Um, 
so um whatever it is china should cooperate uh, how to you know ensure that is not in my area of expertise at all but um what to the rest of us do um so i don't have a next slide but basically we need to think about how to make research on dangerous pathogens safer um globally and china is not the only guilty party as shahid said there have been many cases of lab leaks of viruses in the past none of which really happened in china a lot of them happened in the west so this is a conversation that should start so i'll stop with that uh, thanks uma thanks rahul uh, there's uh, several questions i don't know whether we should uh, take them now or should we just keep going because we're already running a bit late yeah maybe we yeah. statements and then we collate the questions it's quite likely that we'll have uh... yeah yeah sounds good so uh, i'm really uh, um, great pleasure to uh, thanks so much rahul um, i'm not able to stop sharing again i don't know what happened so no, the... it seems to be open but for okay, us good. it's okay good yeah uh, i'm really happy to welcome deepa uh, agashe from ncbs to share her views deepa uh so since we've already discussed a little bit about the origins and the evolution and the latest uh data that have come out i won't take too much time what i'd like to simply point out is we we would all like to know simple answers to these questions of where uh what's the origin of something that is devastating our populations at the moment but the reality is that ecology and evolutionary processes are not simple they are complicated processes and one reason why they are complicated is because of the way that human populations are structured at the moment so the kumar paper that uh, has been referenced by the previous two speakers uh, is actually very very interesting um for multiple reasons and i think i'll use that paper as my standing point to say two things that i want to say one is that it it shows or suggests very clearly that apart from wuhan in the in different parts of china in fact many different parts of the world by january there were different lineages of this coronavirus that were already circulating and were evolving and spreading and wuhan happens to be the case, the, the point where we first noticed a, a big cluster and something big happened uh, that we sort of understood better uh but it's very very clear if you look at the set of mutations that were accumulating in different lineages uh they were there from earlier perhaps two months earlier perhaps three months earlier than december 2019 and so the reality is there are multiple sort of original lineages which diversified from the very very first um sars cov2 that probably infected the first human um very quickly it diversified and once that lineage diversified uh it continued to evolve independently from other lineages for quite some time and then of course now we see that the wuhan lineage is one of the dominant ones but there are others as well that did not uh come originally from the wuhan lineage so what this means is partly because of the large population that we have in uh human population that we have the virus can circulate independently of other sibling viruses for quite some time uh, accumulating different sorts of mutations and we can trace that using evolutionary analysis um the second thing is there are many different factors actually related point to this is there are many different factors that influence how fast mutations will accumulate how many mutations will occur this depends on the population size of the virus itself in this particular case coronaviruses are also known to recombine um as uh, i think rahul you explained so recombination means that instead of going one mutational step at a time you can have you know a large step that is being taken which incorporates multiple mutations effectively that occurred in some other lineage but you have access to it because of this recombination that happens and so um the spatial structure the large population size of the host in this case uh the mutation rate of the organism all of these determine how many mutations will happen how fast will something adapt to its host so to understand all of these parameters and to be able to track back and say in the absence of a time machine exactly what happened is difficult so uh we will need to be a little bit more patient to be able to understand this better and the second thing i think um that all of these recent analyses have highlighted is that we can use tools developed for different sets of applications of basic understanding of evolutionary biology and sequence evolution to apply them in interesting ways so this kumar paper actually uses an analysis 
uh, that is not a traditional phylogenetic analysis. They don't create phylogenies because phylogenies were becoming problematic for this analysis. It was hard to know what was the root of the phylogeny, as Rahul just mentioned. So what they've done is they've used a method that is actually used to trace cancer cell lineages uh, in, in, uh, you know, by cancer biologists. And they use that to ask, what is the most likely trajectory of mutations that were accumulated in different lineages, given what we see right now in the genomic data set, uh, and what we see as a function of time. That is really interesting. So there are new analyses we can do, use them in different situations. Um, but the key point here is, it's hard to predict exactly what kind of analysis from which subfield of science is going to become useful in what context. And so we need to be able to quickly communicate and, and wrap our heads around um, different kinds of research to be able to use it as required when these pandemic situations arise. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Deepa. Um, that was uh, really interesting to hear. I just take a, a one question, a couple of questions which pertain to evolution and phylogenies uh, before we move on to uh, more about viruses from uh, and you know infectious agents from Robin and Varda. So the question goes, if the original SARS-CoV-2 virus was evolved in the lab by directed evolution, would those trees be very different from the trees that we are seeing today? And if the furin cleavage site did pop up in SARS-CoV-2, how long would such a convergent evolution take? Can that be predicted from other known examples that have been shown? Um, the short answer is it's very hard to say any of the answers to any of these, right? Because it depends a lot on exactly what conditions we provide in the lab. So if you're doing the directed evolution experiment for evolving any pathogen in the lab, you would typically give it one kind of host to evolve in and adapt to. But that's not what a real virus is going to encounter in the real world, right? All of us have lots of differences as hosts for these viruses. And so whether, uh, I mean, I would say it's generally unlikely that you would see the exact same set of mutations coming up in the lab uh, experiment that you would see in nature. And we do have examples of this with other directed evolution experiments people have done in the lab, not just in the context of host pathogen, but of adapting any organism to, you know, in the lab and seeing what happens outside. In some cases, there are very clear sort of big mutations or big uh, important functional changes that are likely to happen. So for example, in a lab directed evolution study, would you see mutations if, for example, we evolve these viruses on human cell populations in the lab. Would you see uh, increased transmissibility? Given the right conditions, yes, you would. And would it happen through the spike protein? Likely, yes, because that is, after all, the main way that these viruses are entering our cells. So in that sense, some, to some extent, we can predict. To some extent, if we know the function of functional impacts of different mutations, which we do know to some extent from site-directed mutagenesis studies in this virus, we may be able to predict whether that's exactly what we see outside, I would think highly unlikely. Uh, but the uncertainty is what I would like to highlight here is that we can learn some things from lab evolution studies, but the unknowns and the uncertainty and the number of parameters that influence how evolution actually occurs in the wild is large. And so it's hard, it makes it very hard to say exactly what will happen. Exactly, so in the sense that, you know, what plays out, uh, what played out is one instance of evolution. While we know many drivers, we know processes like mutations and selection and so on, and we can predict the gamut of possibilities, uh, honing in on the exact thing which did happen is sometimes uh, is really difficult. Would that be okay to say? Okay, great. So uh, so maybe now I'll ask if, if Robin could uh, share his thoughts. Thanks, Deepa. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, thanks all the, thanks Uma and thanks all the people who spoke before me. Well, the question, what was the index isolate from which the pandemic virus <clears throat> arose? As the Shahid said the other day, it is very difficult to prove or disprove, frankly speaking. Ideally, <clears throat> being an experimental biologist, the ideal condition to have a robust data Basically, the theoretical situation basically would have been three interlinked longitudinal data sources. First, the virus isolate being cultured in the Wuhan lab at the time, the COVID-19, if it is, the sequences thereof and the isolates thereof, their records. 
second is the first lot of two or more scientists from one institute of virology who got infected the isolates have been obtained from them and third is the first cases of general public from the city of wuhan who got admitted the virus isolates have been obtained from them and the sequences they are this is a you know the copy book situation to get the all the data in your platter that this is the sequences and this is the similarities it has appeared from lab and we can prove by this way well this is beyond the expectation because even if uh, i believe that some data has been taken off from uh, uh, ncr ncbi data you know if there are sometimes in this high security labs many a times at state sponsored data generation or objectives are there or there may be some over zealous scientists trying to go beyond the mandate which are also which are there are instances globally spread like that and uh, such programs are very well controlled not only in china or maybe there may be other all big countries have such programs and such data not necessarily have been linked to a server uploaded in a system which is linked through a servers global they may be in stand alone servers or stand alone uh, <coughs> computers so it is next to impossible to get those data but even if we could get the isolate data from the first two or few scientists who got infected in the who got admitted one of them died from the one institute of virology possibly then also you could think of something like that but because of absence of this i don't think we'll ever come very conclusively to pinpoint the index virus whether it is from spillover genotic spill, i mean genotic spillover possibly one extreme as said mentioned in this slide the first type it's not clear because there is no such linked uh, isolate present in any of the natural uh, <coughs> animal are or not harboring such isolates whether it is through an intermediate host that is yet to be proved conclusively because that is a tendency because of their earlier experience in china but as a, as such lab leak we can't prove or disprove because we don't have the data and without that data you can't correlate that but what is important to note for uh from this whole episode is that if we in future start doing since serious working on some future pandemic or any such isolates <clears throat> there has to be a proper control or oversight regulation so that there are these are purely done for science and not for any over zealous other beyond mandate of of science but how to control that and that is that is a very very tricky uh, issue to uh, handle at this forum but if the data is always kept and shared and the resources are shared then only you can really quickly get to such scenarios unfortunately if you if you all are aware of the scenarios in our country you know it, it, to get a virus isolate from one agency's institute to another agency's institute is a hell of a problem in our own country many people have experienced like that so we we should first smoothen out the regulatory scenario for fair and open research environment to get to the root quickly and to find out how to avoid such scenarios it is beyond any discussion that we won't never get into the however strong the circumstantial evidence is maybe to pinpoint or blame as a the source of the pandemic or index scenario isolates arose from any particular lab the lab leak whether it arose from i mean got muted it was it it was some earlier form also that got through aerosol uh, got into some of the staff members got mutated 
cause pathogenesis, then came into general population. That is also very hard to prove because I don't think any isolate from hospitalized uh, patients from WIV were ever generated. If it generated also, it is not accessible. So these are some of the uh, issues that has to be kept in mind that if such isolates are handled, they have to be handled properly in proper uh, facilities, before facilities, and the data has to be very well curated and kept, possibly should be shared between the people very freely, should not be a hegemony of that this organization is under this agency and we have to take permission from that agency's head office from Delhi. It becomes a, a, a non-issue when the research gets thorted and it becomes more uh, issue of, uh, uh, you know, the organizational uh, identity. So such things should not happen. But at the same time, I am foreseeing that uh, with this pandemic and there are the thousands of research projects which were submitted sometime to Banal also. I had been associated with some of the DBT funding, uh, the scope to related. There will be just like oxygen uh, the required was insufficient, so lots of oxygen plants are coming up, possibly some more P4 facilities will come up. But these are huge capital intensive facilities. They need to be properly used and should not be that someday it was developed for making a, working on HIV and <laughs> the HIV work is almost non-existent. So there people are trying to find out programs to justify the existence of the P4 facility and getting fund from DBT and DBT saying no, and that becomes a, just a white elephant and lying there without being used. So these are the, some of the ramifications which should not happen because we are severely resource poor, I would say, in comparison to us two decades back, China made at least two log more sequencing facilities all over the country. They are possibly having the highest churning out capability of sequence today in the world as a nation. But if sequences from that scenario does not come out for finding the index isolate, better not spend more time on that. Think how to control more on that, but take the lessons and see how appropriate data generation and sharing can be tuned up for better scientific discoveries. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks. Um, I'll now request Varta. Varta, you're uh, backlit. I don't know whether there's a light. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you look mysterious. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll request Varda to uh, give his thoughts. And there's a couple of questions actually on biosafety and genomics, but maybe we'll take those after Varda. Well, I'll uh, share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks, uh, Uma, and thanks all for uh, it's a nice discussion. I just want to give a different flavor to this discussion. Uh, there's been a lot of talk today on uh, uh, mutations and sequences and uh, how do these mutations arise and how can we use the sequences to track back to the index mutation. Uh, the abstract also said that uh, the virus is here and looks like from all indications it's uh, here to stay. So we probably have to learn to live with it. So with, with that in mind, I would like to give uh, a different uh, sort of uh, perspective, which is like, what do these uh, mutations mean, right? So uh, here is the spike protein. This is the structure of the uh, spike protein. And uh, this is one of the regions of the spike proteins and the commonly occurring mutations are mapped to this uh, protein here. So we also know and we have heard of some variants being more infective than the uh, other variants. So I think these mutations more and more, the more we map them to distinct functionalities in the cell is something that we have to uh, seriously start looking at. Uh, for understandable reasons, all the mutations are uh, uh, known and mapped to the uh, spike protein. And a lot of spike protein mutation is in heavily in uh, spotlight because that is how the virus is known to enter into the cell. 
But mutations are occurring throughout the genome. Some regions are more tolerant, some regions are not. Some mutations are more to tolerant, some are not. I just want to take this moment to reflect on the complex uh, life cycle of the virus. Entry is, is one part of it, right? And uh, this is the uh, spike protein and the discussions on all the mutations and the way it's classified are all centered here. Mutations do happen throughout the genome. And if you look at this uh, sort of uh, figure, it's uh, fairly complex, but I will uh, take, take you through this in a simplified way. Once the virus binds to its uh, receptor and the protease uh, is, is cleaved, then it gets into the cell. And if you're a virus here, you have to, the first thing that you have to do is to get the RNA out, right? So that means uh, all these things that helped in gaining entry into the cell are sort of dispensed and the RNA is out and then the RNA has to be replicated. And once the RNA is replicated, it undergoes this very unusual translation of a single polypeptide. And then it is all cleaved to generate multiple functional entities. Then it sort of hijacks the ER machinery and to engages in this replicates complex where the, there is a lot of replication of this RNA happens. Now, after this, all these individual components are going to be packaged in a, in a perfect stoichiometry, again, through a viral packaging mechanisms that we poorly understand. And after this, the packaged virus has to be released so that it can go and infect another cell. So all of this is happening inside the, the cells. And we, I think we, we, know, we don't know much about how individual mutations in not just the spike protein, but in the other regions of the genome are affecting and influencing all these processes. So I think subtle changes here and there can have significant effect on this entire cycle and a deeper understanding of all these processes is certainly the, the need of the day. Um, I will just take you through some uh, nice movies that I found uh, on uh, this is a nice paper that came where they are uh, reconstructing the uh, cell at an ultrastructural resolution. And you can see the kind of changes that the virus is inducing into the cell. Okay. So what you're seeing in pink is, uh, is a cell. And uh, you can see this is, it's a section going through a single cell at an ultrastructural resolution. This is the boundary of the cell. And as you go through this now, you can see the individual uh, structures here. The red ones are all the replication complexes of the virus. So the virus is getting replicated in all these red structures. The brown one is the mitochondria and the blue one is the Golgi, right? So you can immediately see that there is something massively wrong here. Golgi is typically a very compact structure that is seen in a single place, but there is a massive fragmentation of the Golgi that is happening here. So there is a lot of very, uh, very, very interesting biology that is happening in this interface that we are, uh, a lot of this is also known from other uh, coronaviruses, but how many of these events are specific for the SARS-CoV-2 and how uh, these changes, how these mutations affect these changes is something I think we really need to understand. So just to give an example, so here is going to be a zoom of this uh, replication complex in red, which is interfacing very closely with the endoplasmic reticulum in green and forming these yellow structures here, which are sort of connecting this uh, virus that is replicating inside these structures with the endoplasmic reticulum, right? So uh, I just thought I will give a visual perspective of what is happening once the virus uh, infects inside the cell and leave us with a question and leading on to a discussion on what do all these uh, mutations mean and do we have sufficient data now that we have millions of genomes sequenced, do we have sufficient data to start mapping these genotypes to specific phenotypes? Obviously, there is a serious resource crunch, right? So we cannot do all this kind of work for all the millions of uh, mutations. But if we have to sort of narrow down specifically to see, okay, here is an interesting mutation. This is what is spreading in the population. Why is it spreading in the population? Are any of these distinct steps downstream? Once it infects a cell affected, how we can study them? Do we see patterns there, right? And again, I want to leave you with this question that uh, what we are seeing, the movie that you saw is from a single cell that is infected. Uh, we always in the lab, uh, use a few specific cell lines that are uh, infected, 
right? How uh, similar or different are these individual steps across the different types of uh, cell types that get infected? Open questions. Uh, in organoid models, are they going to be different? Open questions. So I think we really have to form a panel of assays uh, and put them into some kind of a streamlined way where we can then start looking at whenever there is a mutation occurring in the population, then we have a pipeline, uh, a conveyor belt through which we can process all these um, um, mutations. So I think I will leave you with that thought. Um, uh, this is not really related to the origin discussion, but I think it, it's sort of a consequence of the evolution of the viruses and what it means for the infection process itself. Thank you. Thanks, Varda. That was really interesting to hear, uh, you know, and see your perspective on, uh, you know, how virus, how the virus infects cells. So I, I just want to ask, and I, I really like that you, uh, you know, asked this question about genotype versus phenotype. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to ask you for the benefit of the listeners, because there's also been a question about uh, biosafety. Um, you know, uh, can we understand these things without growing the virus? Uh, I think certainly, yes. It depends on what you mean by this, because uh, as I said, uh, this is a fairly complex process occurring at multiple levels, right? And we do have tools, for example, uh, we can we can package only the spike protein into a kind of a vectors without the infectivity of the virus. And we can use such a, what we can call as a pseudotyped virus in a fairly detailed way to look at the entry process, right? Now, so we can break down the problem into tangible units and accordingly the complexity becomes uh, lesser uh, and therefore the ease of use becomes more. But I think eventually you will have you will have to put them all in an infection context, right? So, so uh, yeah. it is possible technically to break certain modules, not all, into individual units, which does not require such elaborate biosafety uh, levels. But if you want to get an integrative view of the entire cycle and how mutations are affecting individual steps, I think we have to go the whole way. Yeah, and so culturing virus, uh, of course, under appropriate biosafety, is important to, to understanding, uh, you know, not just what mutation, like the consequences of these mutations as the virus is evolving. Is, would I be paraphrasing you correctly there? Absolutely, yes. So appropriate uh, biosafety uh, levels, appropriate uh, regulatory uh, approvals. I think there is no room for any, um, any doubt there. Yeah, great. Thank you. There's uh, another question, which I guess maybe uh, both, um, uh, I guess either Rahul or, Deepa uh, could both address. Uh, based on data about mutations of coronaviruses so far, can we computationally predict mutations which are likely to happen in the future, making it potentially more deadly? Uh, I can maybe start off and Rahul, feel free to jump yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, so there are two issues to consider when thinking of what is the impact, functional impact of any mutation. One is um, whether it interacts with other mutations and that is the harder part. So many times the screens that we can do in, in lab, so what people have done, for example, with this coronavirus is that then they've uh, made random mutations, usually single mutations, and asked how it, uh, it changes the virus's ability to infect cells in the lab. And so we know something, of course, is they've only done for parts of the spike protein, which are the most important for infecting cells. Uh, it's a much harder task to do this um, just computationally um, and, and of course, experimentally to do it all across. Um, so the one, one aspect is the logistical uh, challenges, uh, both with computational as well as exponential data sets. And the second is then extending what we get out of those data sets to ask what happens with multiple mutations. So uh, I'm sure some of you have heard that some of the variants we see around right now are not variants that are um, you know, monsters because of a single mutation. They're typically uh, multiple mutations that have um, allowed these variants to gain the ability to have higher transmission or higher pathogenicity and so on. Uh, and predicting these interactions between mutations is a much harder task. Uh, so my, uh, and this is something people are trying to do in general in evolutionary biology a lot, uh, especially with microbial evolution, but it remains difficult to do. So I don't know if uh, Rahul wants to jump in. Yeah, I don't think I have very much to add to that. Um, so 
one thing to say is that you know mutations happen all the time and uh, there are two components to evolution is mutation and there is selection and uh, mutations are essentially random so you can't predict where a mutation will happen so the question uh, was i guess can you predict which mutations will end up spreading and being uh, more virulent and so on um which is uh, has to be done computationally because you have to predict as the position what a new mutation will make a protein more effective i don't think uh, anyone is close to that kind of uh, computational capacity right now so what's happening is that right now this virus is all over the world it is spreading even in countries which seem to have cleared it out it is spreading in the population and occasionally um, and as it spreads it mutates most of these mutations are harmless and uh, occasionally something surfaces that makes it more virulent and uh, large ma majority of the mutations probably just die out because they don't have any fitness advantage um that's broadly the picture so i don't think it can be predicted uh, at this point yeah the process the process of mutation we understand we can model it but right. what exactly will mutate when is something which is hard to predict exactly also exactly. we select yeah, anything can mutate at any time yes well no but also what's i mean the question like is about selection and what will spread or you know yes. be successful yeah. and that also is difficult because uh, yeah because basically our understanding of both the functional aspects of how the uh, virus infects cells as well as how evolution occurs in general are much more about the process at a broad broader level right but exactly which mutation will have what impact under what conditions that is a much much harder question uh, to predict yeah uh, and so uh, uh, also that if the mutation is harmless we may not notice because it gets diluted and goes away only those which become pathogenic that gets noticed so as we said many mutations are happening only if it is making becoming pathogenic and staying in the population get sequence gets looked after and you identify those things there is a huge number happening all the time actually there are best estimates available with another rna virus called vesicular stomatitis virus where uh, they estimated that only about 3% of all the mutations led to a positive effect for the virus most mutations were deleterious to the virus uh, and some were just neutral either gave no advantage to the virus so so it's it's really the ones that show any positive effect are the ones that are selected the majority of mutations are never seen because they're deleterious thanks for bringing that up shahid that's actually really a uh, important point and something which deepa uh, in her lab also works on the distributional distribution of fitness effects for mutations and of uh, all of us uh, have usually thought that it's they're mostly deleterious slightly deleterious and few advantages for the virus so i guess i just ask one question then i'll uh, go to the others but then why aren't we seeing um you know more of these slightly deleterious mutations accumulating in the virus uh, and then you know ultimately causing it to not be as infective well you won't see that virus would you yeah But i think time. that's the point now over time um you you have a population right so uh, it's not like the entire population gets the deleterious mutation a few individuals do and those individuals don't survive so that's essentially that's why species don't die out due to deleterious mutations either right okay great so there's a question for varda uh on based on varda's presentation has anyone looked at the variance of concern to determine whether there are mutations in other genes than the spike protein and another one um uh, in the viral replication process with the golgi fragmentation and other changes spec are the uh during viral replication is the golgi fragmentation specific to cov2 or do other viruses show similar impacts okay so the the first question yes of course there are uh, mutations all over the the genome uh, uh so i think that's that's the answer uh, 
Uh, and for reasons I mentioned, and maybe everybody agrees, is that the mutations in the spike proteins are the ones that are in, in highlight. Uh, but I think we, we should start uh, focusing or looking at the other uh, mutations also. And so before I answer... To add to, to, add to what you're saying, Vardha, the alpha variant, for example, I think contains 17 mutations or something like that. Hmm. Uh, the Delta one possibly contains 15. There's another one that contains 23 mutations. Hmm. So yeah, there are many mutations in uh, several other genes as well. Yeah. But the ones we really focus on is spike because that's the one we're most concerned about. Yes. Uh, immune escape. No, so for example, if in the polyprotein processing region, if there are any mutation, right, it's going to have serious downstream effects. And what I'm trying to say, uh, a larger thing is that we have to start mapping these phenotypes to the mutations. So similarly, the egress pathway, if the virus is not able to get out due to the mutation, then that's basically a, a dead end for the sure. virus. So the, the second question is uh, about uh, the fragmentation of Golgi in particular, how specific it is for uh, COV-2. I think the, the life cycle that I described is largely true for most uh, coronaviruses. Most of them go through a similar pathway, a lot of other uh, RNA uh, viruses as well. And I, I think there will be, uh, uh, there will be uh, important significant differences, both at, the, at a molecular and a subcellular level. And I think we really have to start mapping what these differences are and, and the effect of mutation on, on these uh, differences. And therefore, I think uh, it's important to have a panel of assays at these various levels so that we can uh, start these mapping. But uh, the biology of coronaviruses largely across this uh, life cycle uh, uh, is conserved. There's another question on evolution. How, how well do we know the problems associated with lower vaccination rates in adding to evolutionary pressure, if any, on the virus? So I would say more than that, the use of indiscriminate uh, plasma therapy. You know, plasma therapy where you don't know the level of antibody present uh, could have driven, uh, you know, some of these variants. In fact, the prevailing hypothesis for the generation of the alpha variant in UK is that uh, you know it developed in somebody who had a very weak immune system and the virus persisted in that person for uh, a very long time. So yeah, that's, that's very much possible. I mean, you give any kind of selection pressure, the virus will try to resist it. And if that selection pressure is not, if, if the pressure is not strong enough. I mean, it's no different from what happens to a bacterium during, uh, you know, you, when you when you treat it with antibiotics. Yeah, you know, one, one of the simplest scenario to generate directed evolution of virus in vitro is, you know, theoretically you can generate them, though it will not be a, as robust a evolutionary selection as in a, in a homeostatic condition in a human body or in animal body. But in vitro, you can raise multiple antibodies in rabbit, purify them, and go on adding in multiple uh, replicates. The viruses are going. You go on adding multiple combination of these purified antibodies, IgM and IgG, and see, would add that supernatin back to some target cells and see whether you are getting a new isolate. These are some of the things people used to do over ages in earlier days in vitro. So some, somebody was speculating whether such thing was going on in Wuhan lab and uh, something escaped from that. And these are just in, in, in naysayers, so. I just want to quickly also yeah. mention after this about uh, the question about the vaccines and whether that would uh, lead to selection for escapes, escapee variants. Um, yes, in some sense, but that is also why it's really important to vaccinate at a larger fraction of the population as soon as possible. Because even if in one person there arises a mutant or a variant that is able to escape that person's immune function to some extent, it still has to find a host to be able to spread. And as, as long as we minimize the chances that that virus is able to spread and then you know uh, infect more people, 
uh, the, the fact that we're putting selection pressure through vaccines is not going to ultimately be detrimental. So it's very, very important to vaccinate rapidly and as completely as possible in a particular population. Deepa, maybe one possible uh, uh, sort of background to this question could also be the extended dose interval that we have in India now, you know, 12 to 16 weeks of, of COVID shield. Uh, I don't know if the person who's asking this question really wanted to understand that. Uh, but, you know, if, if you extend the gap of the first, between the first dose and the second dose too much, is it possible that your antibody levels fall to a point where when you get infected at that time, uh, you know, you may not neutralize the virus, instead you may actually select uh, uh, or the pressure of neutralization. Yeah, pressure of neutralization fall below the optimal, allowing right. the new variant right. to develop mutations. Yeah. The well, study that it was me who, was, who asked that question because it absolutely is relevant for us to know um, how we combat this and how what we understand about the evolution rates. And low vaccination rates and longer gaps might actually increase the, uh, the risk of developing um, more deadly, potentially uh, deadly uh, variants. So I think uh, there's an immediate need to also look at um, you know, the breakthroughs and also to assess yeah. uh, vaccination programs, which will immediately clamp down on the novel variants and so that we don't go into no, you know, yeah. generate more. So breakthroughs are very important to study. Uh, but I'll just quickly address uh, the broader question or less of you know, whether extending the, the, the time between two doses is likely to impose new selection pressures on these viruses. Um, we don't unfortunately have good data for this, as far as I know, for Covishield and Covaxin. Uh, in terms of over time after vaccination, how does the immune response change in the body uh, across a period of months? Uh, but whatever data we do have for this, for the mRNA vaccines, it's very clear that the levels of different kinds of immune responses are fairly high still. Uh, even five to six to eight months after uh, people are vaccinated or have had an infection. So to me, it sounds like, and I'm, again, I'm not an immunologist, so I, you know, please correct me uh, if anybody in the audience would like to correct me. But it sounds to me that the selection pressure on the virus to evade our immune responses is not going to be particularly increased by uh, the dose being extended to the extent we have it now. Um, of course, a very, very long delay will increase the chances that we will not be able to mount immune responses that can contain the virus at sufficient levels. Um, yeah. Also, yeah, I, I'd like to add to this that, uh, no, I'm not a virologist or an immunologist, but from what I understand in uh, the UK, the recommendation had first been made to increase the uh, gap between doses more because of the efficacy, but also, in order to vaccinate as many people with the first dose as possible. So um, the are completely right in saying we have to you know, vaccinate as many as possible, but in reality, no country has that many doses right now. And even in the UK, a large majority has got the first dose, but only a small minority has got the second dose so far. And most countries are even worse off. So the question is, what do we do in this situation? Is it better to get as many people the first dose as possible? Or is it better to give people the second dose as soon as we can? And um, I don't think there is a conclusive answer to that. But as Deepa says, it appears antibody levels stay high for months after the first dose, at least for the mRNA vaccines and also after infections, most likely also for Covishield. It also seems that the Covishield or AstraZeneca vaccine gives high um protection with a single dose against severe disease and hospitalization, though it is not so efficacious against mild disease, you're uh, quite likely to get infected despite one dose, but um, you're not like, you're much less likely to have severe disease. With all these things uh, in mind and given the production constraints, um, I don't think we can really say that we should not increase the dose, uh, gap between doses because of this possible risk of variance. I don't think that is established. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right, Raul. I, I think the, 
dose increase, uh, there really is no problem because now there is really real world data showing that uh, even a single dose protects sufficiently against severe disease. And no vaccine is really protecting against symptomatic uh, infection uh, very well. So I, I think that's fine. And the, the amount of antibodies we make, even after a single dose, with possibly any vaccine, is much more than that is needed to, uh, to neutralize the virus. But at the, at the same time, breakthrough infections have to be characterized. Uh, Thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone on the panel. There are several questions uh, in the uh, or in the YouTube uh, as well. But I think we should probably start wrapping up. Uh, it's almost an hour and a half. So maybe I'll ask uh, Ulas to uh, give some concluding statements. Yeah, maybe uh, rather than me concluding, I would uh, quickly ask, uh, uh, since we're running short of time, uh, both Shahid and you, please um, emphasize on the need for studying the viruses and why viruses are important for humans. Um, not because we are simply scientists and we want to keep ourselves busy studying things, but uh, really how, uh, how have viruses shaped us and our evolution? And why is it still going, uh, it's important to go back and look at these uh, and study some of these um, viruses? Um, despite the risks that are associated with potential lab leaks or by safety level concerns that we have. Um, how or why is it important even for India to invest in uh, this and um, will it be beneficial as a country as we go forward? Uh, Ulaas, uh, Ulaas, if I can, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be interrupting, but uh, there, there are some very pointed and direct questions from audience, which I thought uh, they should all, a few of them. If Uma can just pick up quickly, uh, and also if the panelists can answer, just point. You know, there are there are some I think sort sort of you know more you questions. If you if you can take another five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a question from Tarun. Point zero three percent people who've become COVID positive after single dose may be deciding factor for viral evolution. I guess that was. Uh, kind of answer that there doesn't seem to be uh, um, suggestions that you know uh, this low vaccination rate and the high interval could lead to uh, um, accelerated evolution of the virus. Uh, in wait, that's can any of the mutations change or reduce the protection through the vaccine that we see now? Yes, I mean there is. There is evidence for that already that vac vaccine effectiveness is reduced with several mutations. Uh, and that's why we call these variants of concern because all of these, uh, you know, have, you know, affect the effectiveness of vaccines. So yes, absolutely. So is there not anything like antivirus? No, there is none, no specific antivirus. Actually, instead of uh, analyzing the mutations, if you have got a mirror image of the uh, this uh, virus, and if we directly act on the uh, opposite side of the virus, uh, because in nature, for everything, there is a uh, mirror image, which is the counterpoint of the thing. And analyzing will be very difficult. And instead of antibodies, why uh, antivirus is not researched? That is no, what there I is want a, to there do. Is, there is extensive research on antivirals. It's yes. just that nobody has been able to find anything uh, uh, that has uh, the efficacy. The same mechanism of, of the virus, if it is replicated, and when the virus is generated, antivirus will also start uh, designing itself against the virus. That should be the mechanism. We cannot analyze such a micro minute thing, how the mutations take place. Yeah, so, so, uh, so they, let it be from a lab or from anywhere. A virus is a virus mm -hmm. or a cell is a cell. And uh, this way, uh, can, uh, research cannot be done, uh, means uh, mirror image, uh, what I mean. We must create a mirror to see the virus. Yeah, and Vijay, uh, the way thanks. it changes, so the uh, image also will change like that. So Vijay, Without going uh, into analysis of the process. 
Well, I mean, I guess, um, you know, there has been uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion and work on antivirals. And uh, Varda, for example, has also been investigating this to use approved drugs. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess what we understand from antivirals and what Vijay understands from antivirals is possibly something different. different. Yeah. He, he um, is uh, thinking about a complete mirror image of the virus to be an antivirus. It's like matter and antimatter. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Did I don't know, know anyone would like to comment on that quickly. Yes. Um, we nominate Rahul to comment on it. Yeah. But well, that's basically what our antibodies are, right? They're, <laughs> they're, that's what they are exactly. So we have to use antibodies. I have a if, question. if I can just add on to that, uh, I think there is also uh, very, very extensive efforts all over the world to do a lot of drug screens to find uh, antivirals drugs that is going to be effective against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So while, while there's been a lot of focus on uh, vaccines, there has also been an extensive focus on finding drugs against the, the virus. That's, that's just a point I wanted to add. Thanks. Um, I'd like to say also, you know, antivirals are very important for, for example, HIV. Uh, that's what keeps them alive. But uh, it took years to find drugs that worked and we are probably not there yet. Uh, people have tried remdesivir, fivipiravir, all these antivirals. None of them are particularly efficacious. Well, these but are more or less is, uh, yeah, repurposing. Just, and just, some like, my, some just like microscope, we must have a micro mirror. So uh, only watching the virus is not important, but its nature directly without our understanding, let the uh, computational way, let the computer itself analyze that and um, create anti its image, actually. And then uh, that uh, data will be useful for us which will uh, okay. directly tell us Thanks. about yeah. the virus. That is the nature we have to understand through our uh, uh, entities, uh, our created yeah. entities. Thanks. And com Thanks, computer, Thanks. put it into computer, computers. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Vijay. Um, yes. So we're running quite late. So maybe yeah, I'll have... Yeah. It was a very interesting and very nice discussion. Yeah. I enjoyed Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Th uh, maybe I'll ask Shahid to uh, summarize his thoughts for the future. You know, where do we go from here? Uh, not just in terms of COVID-2. Well, I think this question, whether it came from a lab or it came from a bat, uh, will not be resolved uh, in the near future. I, I really don't think it will ever be resolved. Uh, so I, it's, it's really important to move ahead and see the, and look at the lessons that we have learned from, from this pandemic. And uh, there have been some really, really important lessons. So the, you know, the first lesson has been that uh, uh, science has really helped. Uh, you know, we used to make uh, vaccines in 10 to 15 years. We've made multiple vaccines and vaccines that work within, uh, within a year. Uh, so, all those people who are saying that these vaccines developed within a year are not safe. Next time a pandemic comes around, the same people will say, well, you could make a vaccine against COVID in less than 12 months. Why can't you make it in six months? Uh, so that, that's where it is going. So I think it's very important to have platforms available that can be repurposed very, very quickly if something emerges. And whether, you know, when a new pandemic will emerge, we don't know. When localized outbreaks will happen, we don't know. We don't know whether, you know, India may have an outbreak for which India will need a vaccine that the world may not need. Uh, so I think those capabilities have to be developed, uh, uh, not just in the West, but here as well. And, you know, a key thing that we saw in this pandemic uh, is that while we have a lot of vaccine manufacturing capacity, uh, we didn't really provide any of the research on the vaccines uh, that are currently in use. Uh, of course, Covaxin, but Covaxin, there was very little research. It was you know, growing up the virus and 
giving it to the company that developed the process for it. And they already had a developed process for various inactivated vaccines. But I don't believe inactivated vaccines are the future uh, simply because uh, they are cumbersome to make. Uh, inactivated uh, COV-2 vaccine uh, you know, requires highly contain high containment facilities. And a single batch of vaccine takes four months to make. So no wonder, uh, you know, with all the fanfare with which Covaxin was approved, we have only given it to 10% of the population so far, uh, those who have taken the vaccine. So those are some of the things that will come up uh, in future. And maybe I'll, I'll leave it to you, Umar, to talk about uh, the effect of ecology and environment and, you know, spillovers. Thanks, Shahid. Uh, before, while I'm doing that, maybe just uh, remind the panelists if there are questions in the chat that you could answer, uh, please do so. So, uh, you know, uh, Shahid uh, and all of you, it's been a fantastic discussion. And uh, Shahid, you spoke about, um, you know, how we can um, re respond uh, to uh, a pandemic uh, should it come around again. Uh, I guess, you know, I am someone who work in nature. I study nature. And so, uh, my my interest uh, is in trying to prepare for and maybe prevent um, the uh, spillover of such zoonoses uh, and emergence of such pathogens. Uh, and there's many studies across the world which suggest why such spillover happens, the correlates of such spillover. Uh, and these are known, uh, but exactly what will happen when is something which we must uh, study and prepare for. Uh, and one thing which is required for that is more studies on uh, known reservoirs like bats, rodents, uh, primates, and so on. So uh, while we may uh, be afraid of such studies or um, unsure of uh, why we should study anything in the unknown, the unknown is always scary. Uh, human interfaces with wildlife are something we, much, we must characterize uh, because uh, just because we don't study them doesn't mean they're not there. Um, studying these interfaces will hopefully allow us to be better prepared uh, and react faster uh, in case such an event like we've seen in the last year occurs again. So um, thanks everyone. And um, I guess we can stop now. Um, yeah, so thanks, I guess it, thanks to Satya for organizing this and thanks to Ulas and all the panelists I think it was a great discussion. And I think we should have more such discussions um, because uh, clearly they're really important and there are lots of questions. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, there are uh, quite a few questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't you know, answer them. Of course, it is already uh, one and three quarters of an hour. So I'm actually taking them on a, uh, you know, I'm saving them and try to paste them in the, uh, in the YouTube uh, what do you call, I mean, the chats or comments, maybe they will get answered hopefully by one of, okay. There are some questions which are of uh, something immediate concern and so on and so forth, but probably couldn't be answered. So we are sorry about that, but uh, I hope you really uh, kind of got a lot of information about this particular topic of a billion dollar question that's happening. Yeah, once again, I don't want to take more of your time, but uh, sincere thanks once again to all the panelists and uh, Professor Data, Uma, Uma, and uh, also Ulas for being instrumental in bringing this. Uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me also, and thanks for this nice time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.